keeping everything in line with it. That's nice. And notice how also I can expand and contract things depending on what level of detail I want to see. So this would be the fun and the no fun section. So for the fun, I'll put fun.aspx, title fun. Fun section. For this one, I'll put the URL of no fun. Now, what did we say was in the fun section? Well, yeah, vac vacations and hobbies, I think. All right. So, I'm going to create inside of the tag for fun, I'm going to create a sitemap node. The URL for it will be hobbies. Title will be hobbies, and we can put in a description. Now, this tag, if you remember, there was nothing underneath hobbies, so I can make that an empty tag. All right. Likewise, I can do the same thing for vacations. And then underneath no fun, I had what? I had work and bio and links, I think. So I'll put those in. Now I haven't created all these pages yet. I probably should, but. I'll remember at least a couple of the pages. We'll create at least a couple of the pages so we can see how this works. So I don't have any blue squiggly lines, which means I have followed all the rules as laid out in the schema for this XML files. I've used the right tags. I haven't used any illegal tags. I've only used the sitemap root tag and the sitemap node tag underneath that. I followed the proper nesting for these. In other words, the rules for nesting say that underneath the sitemap tag, there needs to be one sitemap node. Underneath that sitemap node, there can be as many sitemap nodes as you need. And underneath those, there can be as many as you need, and so on and so forth. All right? So, this is a valid sitemap file. All right? I followed the schema. I followed the rules that have been laid out. And... Now it should work, all right? So, what can we do with this? Well, the first thing we can do with this is we can, instead of manually creating our menu, we can bind it to the sitemap. So, let's go into our master page and get rid of these two navigation items. And I'll go in and I will add a menu but instead of editing the menu items manually I'm going to tie it to a data source. 
So I click Choose Data Source. I haven't yet defined the data source for the sitemap. Now this is a little tricky. Let's, you know, hear me through. I define the sitemap XML file, but I now have to define an object that uses that file to create a data source that I can marry to my visual controls. All right. So I have the sitemap file. I don't have the sitemap data source. So I'll click, I want to create a new data source. And it'll ask me, where am I getting the file data from? Am I getting it from a regular sitemap, which I am, or some kind of XML file that I brewed up on my own? Well, I'm, coming, uh, I'm getting it from a regular sitemap file. The name that it will call this data, uh, data source is sitemap data source 1. Good enough for me. And I click OK. Now, notice what happened. I have then this menu that is bound to that sitemap. So if I run it, I get that menu. I can click on this. I can go to Fun, No Fun, Hobbies, Vacations, and pick the link that I want. I think bio is the only page that exists, so we'll go there. Now, you might say, gee, I want more than just one level to show in this. So I can go in here and edit the properties of that sitemap, I'm sorry, of that menu, and say to always show at least two levels. Or maybe always show three levels. And then it will show all of the levels on the menu. And I can run this and it will always show those three levels. Yeah. Is, is kind of the ultimate purpose behind that to allow for the adding and subtracting of pages without having to go to the menu? And exactly. Okay. Exactly. The idea is, again, is that as we add, as we add, um, pages or as we add or as we change the organization of the pages you know hey my work wasn't fun when I worked as a software developer it wasn't all fun let's put it that way it was it was work, a combination of work and fun there here in teaching it's more fun so maybe I want to move that work section to the fun section I can do that without touching the visual code of it just by changing the site Okay, so we can, we now have that bound to that, which means if we go and change this, I say, wait a minute. My work is fun. What am I talking about here? I can go here and simply by moving this node from there to there, then all of a sudden, work is part of that group instead of the previous group. Yes? Do you, do you mind running through quick again at the add menu, how you bound that again? How I bound that? Sure. Let's do another one from scratch. I went in and I dragged my menu over. All right. Where it said data source, I went in and I said create a new data source. Where does that data source come from? It comes from a sitemap. What name do I want to give it? And then I clicked OK. I'm going to hit cancel. Because we don't need to create another data source, right? Because we already have the one, right? So we can use it um, more than one time. So we're binding the menu to our data source, all right? What else can we do with the sitemap? Well, 
One of the things that we can do is we can do the site map path or breadcrumbs. So let's go in and let's add, and I'm going to add it on my master page, right? Might as well because I want it on every page, all right? So I'll go in and add to my master page. sitemap path. And I'll put it up in the banner section. I guess where you put it, you know, is a design decision, you know, wherever you think it works best. Now when I go and run this, I'll get the breadcrumbs. It tells me I'm on the home page. All right? Tells me I'm on the home page. If I click to the no fun page, it tells me I went from the home page to the no fun page. If I then click on bio, it shows me home, no fun, bio. So it shows me the path to that node in the sitemap file. In other words, it shows me the hierarchy or, you know, how did I get there. All right. And then you can traverse up and back uh, and so on. One thing that's useful to do, but really depends on the site, is to create a site map file, or I'm sorry, a site map page. So I'm going to go and do that just for the heck of it. All right, even though in this case it's probably not really meaningful to do it because the site map, you know, this is a small enough site where the site map shows, the whole site map shows as part of that menu. But just for laughs, I'll go in and I'll create a site map file. I'm sorry, a um, yeah, sitemap page. I'll select master page. And I will go in and since we've already done a menu, I'll do a tree, and the tree I'll do the same thing, and now if we run this, we'll see my sitemap page that. Again, in this case it's not terribly useful because the navigation is there anyhow, but just showing you that you can do the tree view as well. Now, sitemap is only one place that you could use a, uh, you could bind data. Alright, you could actually bind uh, a tree view or part of a tree view to stuff in a database. For example, if you had categories of items, you could go in and you could create um, a binding to pull the list of category of items and, and uh, bind that to the data source. But that's, that's, that's further out down the line. Question. Why doesn't the sitemap path show for this page? doesn't show up in uh, Banner. If you remember the other ones, it did show. If we go to the home page, it shows as home page. If we go to bio, it shows as home page, no fun bio. Why, if we go to the site map, does it not show the breadcrumbs? Pardon me? It wasn't included in, it. It included in the site map XML file. So if we wanted that to appear, 
would have to go and put in the sitemap uh, file where we thought it should appear. Yeah. Let's say for the sake of argument, it should appear here. And there, now it appears there. What is generating the, is it the description that's generating the word sitemap? I think that's the title. The title? Yeah. Because if you remember, uh, I think for fun and no fun, I gave a different description than, than the title. And... I'm not sure where the, the description um, shows up, but it is available. You know, so you could probably, you know, you could probably code something custom to to use that uh, if you wanted to. Now, um, questions about styling these guys. All right. In order to successfully know how to style these guys, all right? By these guys, I mean the output of controls from an ASP, or the output of HTML code from an ASP.NET control. To really understand that, you need to know and understand what HTML gets generated, all right? It'll be confusing to try to style it otherwise, although you can. My preference is whenever I'm in doubt on how to style something, I go back and look at the HTML. And the HTML will tell me how I want it to be styled. Well, it won't literally tell me, but I'll be able to figure it out then. All right, it's probably a better way to put it. Remember, to style something, to apply a style to something, you need to know either some combination of the following. You need to create a selector, right, that points to the thing on the page that you want to style. How can you define, or how do you define selectors? You can define selectors as, number one, an HTML tag. So if I notice that, you know, I could make all my links on a page look a certain way or all my li tags look a certain way, or whatever. So one way I can define a style is by HTML tag. Another way I can define it is based on an ID. Something that has an ID of such and such, I can style. The third way is based on class. And then, of course, there's mix and match. I could, for example, style every li within a certain ID with a certain style. So, let's run this and let's look at our navigation. Here's our navigation. All right. What kind of, what HTML do you suppose that, that is? What, what, what do you suppose is the HTML behind that menu on the side? Yeah, I would guess it's, it's a series of lists. It's probably a series of nested lists. All right, let's see if we're right. Ah, look. UL class equals level one. All right. LI, A title, class equals level one. And so on down the line. There's a class equals level two. Class equals level three. So how can we go about styling these guys? All right. What are our hooks? We don't have ID. Let me let me increase the size of this if I can. A 
If we look at these LIs, we don't have any IDs to hook to, which is probably a good thing, right? Because IDs are going to be on an individual element by element basis. And so that's probably a relief, right? Because that wouldn't be a good strategy anyhow. All right? We can hook to the classes, right? All the level one things have level one as their class. All the level two things have level two as their class, and so on. What's more, we could observe that these are all LIs within the nav section. So let's play around with CSS. Fun with CSS. All right? And let's play around a little bit with the styling of these different things um, based on the fact that we know that we can style based on class, and our classes are level 1, level 2, level 3, and the fact that we can style based on, um, based on what? Based on... Um, the tag as well. So, let's go to my CSS file. And let's write from the back, say something like, and again, I'm going to do these things just to make them obvious. Within the nav, I want to style LIs this way. Let's give a background of red. All right. So all my allies within there got a background of red. All right. Fair enough. What if I wanted them to make them a constant width? Well, oops. should be able to say width 200 px. If you put um, that's interesting, but padding 10 px, but mm -hmm. then shrink it. Well, let's, let's try it. Padding 10px, you said? Yeah, that'll put space from the edge of that to the where the text begins. So effectively, it spaced them out. Um, let's see, what else can we do? Let's put a border around them. Interesting. We're starting to get these guys looking like buttons, right? So we could have a lot of fun with this. All right. Now, what if we wanted to just define a certain level a certain way? All right. Well, what's our hook into the level? The class. All right. So I could define a style rule for the class. And what was the class? Let's say level one. I could define a background of white, let's say. And again, how these CSS works, they cascade. If you define attributes on one level, but not the other, the attributes are defined on the higher level sort of trickle down. Generally speaking, the most specific way that you define it is going to take hold. So if I define a style rule for a tag, and then define a style rule for the class, the class will supersede any of those attributes in common. So... All right. I forgot those are actually level twos. I, I wanted I wanted fun, no fun, and sitemap, but those are actually level twos. 
but I could take care of that by, you know, And we go from there. The point isn't the specific things that I did. The point is, is knowing what your hook is. You know, that's, that's how I like to phrase it. Knowing what you can hook on to to apply a style rule. Remember your choices in general are IDs, are classes, and are HTML tags. And then there's combinations of those. All right? And if you can do that, you can define your style rule. Now, unfortunately, there are times when you have nothing to hook into. All right? When there's nothing in the H, there, there, there's really nothing that you can hook to to apply a style rule. When that is the case, you can use what are called themes within the .NET platform. And I'm going to hold off talking about those for now. All right. Um, probably because the best examples of themes um, we haven't hit yet. So, um, you know, so we'll, we'll, we'll wait until, we'll, <coughs> excuse me, we'll wait until we've covered something that gives us a better uh, example of, of how themes are effectively used. I, I guess I could make up an example now, but we'll wait till we have a better example to go over those. Questions over any of this? That's the interesting thing. You know, you start with a shell like this, right? And um, you know, I've had students say something to the effect of, you know, gee, you know, the, these sites don't look, you know, we, we yeah, I can come up with the sites and I can understand that they look good, but they don't quite look on a professional level. Well, a lot of times it's the little touches that will go and will separate that. You know, for example, if I had a nice background pattern behind that, one of my students in my 216 class had a basic page very similar to this and had just a nice little pattern be behind their banner. That made all the difference in the world. It took a page that looked like, you know, a good basic fundamental page and made it look like a really nice page. So a lot of things, again, in the interest of time, I don't go over everything that you could do, but you know CSS. All right. If not, you should learn it and or review it. Maybe it's a better way to put it. And there's a lot of small touches that you can do to really make the page look a lot better. All right. Uh, it's important for each weekly assignment or, or, or bi-weekly assignment to do that. It's especially going to be important for your project. Um, and this, this one that's coming up as well, Lab 5, is important for that one to look like a completed professional site. All of them need to, but those especially need to. All right, questions. Next week, I think, I'll have to look at my schedule, see if there's any loose ends, but next week we will start discussing databases. And we'll do, uh, we'll do CISS 143 in two, two class sessions, all right? And then we'll get about integrating the stuff onto our web pages. All right, we'll see you over in lab.